is the singer and the song. And the two connect in both directions. Because the pipe goes down in the oh, ground. That's great. And it goes along somewhere and reappears down there. This is the last scene that we're shooting in the documentary. I don't know how it's going to get edited into the final mix, but we're done shooting and we're shooting the fiction film tomorrow. She's waiting, she waits, she waits, she's always waiting. And she's still hoping that he will come to her. And when he doesn't uh, come back to her, that's when she kills herself. What would happen if Butterfly was rewritten? Her option was to, to kill herself, was to make visible what had already happened anyhow. There's a, potentially another option. You are already divorced, but the opera about divorce started when you were still together. So the very beginnings, we have a scene in the kitchen. If you find my beloved, tell him I am sick of love. How about, for I am sick of love. You're singing parts of the aria, and the two of you are together in the kitchen, you're still married. And in some ways, and in I'm my cooking. mind, yes, you're rolling Good. sushi. That is the same line as from no, If you find my beloved, tell him I am sick. It's close. The meter is slightly different. Yeah, the but it's, it's, in, it's in there enough so that it's a nod to uh, Madame Butterfly. Mm. I don't want to start with something too deep, but <laughs> what do you mean by I am sick of love? We're balancing sort of the, the needs of the short film, the wardrobe and the Ari and all of that with the needs of the documentary. I'll introduce you to Emma and we'll go through your wardrobe. Okay. Yeah. Great. And have you met? I haven't met you anybody. Haven't met Carolyn, who's Hi, Carolyn. Cameron's Hi, Carolyn. This is our documentary crew and Aubrey. We can see. I know Aubrey. So yeah. this is our gorgeous documentary crew. And this is Hello. Emma. Hello. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Hello. I want to stay true to the notion of that this is a a riff on the idea of voice. And he has a lot of things, you know, talking about fear, fear generally, how it pertains to voice, loss of voice, vocal height, vocal depth, vocal bridges, those, like I want to start gathering that information because otherwise I'll start feeling anxious. Explain to me how voice is a code word and what it means as far as when people talk about losing their voice. My own history as a performer involves periods of time where I definitely lost parts of my voice. Philosophically, one always says that one never loses one's voice, that you lose something. The three notes I had lost during that period of time. This joke that I always say about my role at the BAM Center as the extended vocal specialist. Mm. Extended is the wrong word, really, because, in fact, what we're doing when we look at the full range of the human voice is looking at the normal voice. Mm -hmm. Specialist is not right because right. specialist implies, you know, doing a kind of vocal training for a specific purpose. My joke is I'm the normal voice, non-specialist. How did you get into the work, Fidesz? Through Banff. It was the first time there was really a gap in my voice. G, G sharp and A. Time I was working on a show in California with a very contemporary group had some injuries a gap right in the middle of my voice had been diagnosed as having a polyp and I wanted to tidy my voice up and get rid of the cracks in a very specific zone and I remember the room so clearly there's no windows in this room and I'm in there with Richard and he says well let's go further into the cracks and I think this guy's fucking insane this is the last place I want to go that's the kind of place I was 
talking about just before the little crack there. My recollection was more, if I'm getting on stage, I want to be perfect as a singer. What purpose would that serve to go into the cracks? Because what I'm asking you mm. to do is help me clean this up. Mm. Because I want to get on stage and be perfect. That's my job. I'm an opera singer. I just really thought it was a professional problem that I'd worked so right. hard. But I just flashed back, because I was living in California. Because as we were talking, then I was trying to think, well, what are the layers underneath? I was getting the final papers for my divorce. I'd been married for two years when I was quite young. I was 22. The voice is this mirror of what's going on. The voice tells us what it needs. I need, I'm missing something. I'm not going to make sound until you acknowledge what it is yeah. that the sound or the lack of it represents. Then there was really a hole right in the middle of my voice, G, G sharp and A. And I was by myself when that happened, meaning I was far from family and friends. So it was never spoken about. It was like, it didn't exist. It was a very strong human connection between us. But for me, a slow marriage in the sense of getting past my prejudice in a way towards this perfect, beautiful vocal ideal and to this one that had this full range. So not being afraid of showing all the different facets of who I would be as a person. When you're working with Fidesz or Anne-Marie or your students, what is it that you're trying to do with breath? Let it pass through the whole body, through each articulation. You know, whether it's shoulder, through the hips, into the knees, right through to the feet, so that the oxygen flows right through every part of our beings. It's like the wave coming up the beach. I know often the time it takes to allow yourself to really have a breath that does fill your whole body. It's almost as if as a singer I would have been too embarrassed to take that time or to nourish myself with that and so the breaths would get, you know, shorter and shorter and I can remember many times you saying, only pay attention to your breath now. And it's as if paying attention to that inspiration allows the exhale or the sound that's going to come out to have an organic sense or a source as opposed to them being separate entities. Now just as an experiment for you days, listen one more time to the one you're doing. Now try and start from where you finished. Inspire, take in-breath. That the in-breath is a preparation and a mirror of what's going to come out. Very often, it's not given more attention than just a kind of refueling. It's the pre-story, it's the anti-story. It's, it's what provides the idea. So it's a thought. In this case, you could say breath is, is a thought. That's better. Now, as you take your in-breath, just let your ribcage open. It's like a balloon filled with water that's going to get heavier at the bottom. It's a very liquid feeling yeah, with I was, breath. Yeah, I had that very word yeah. in my mind, liquidity. It's, um, um, you know, not by chance that we're, you know, well over 60% water. Um, so a lot of the rolling sequences that I do in class are to do with liquidity and, and letting the breath inform the, the, the cells. You feel almost as if you're recontacting your own element, which is largely water. So it feels like swimming. Even though the instrumentation is so measured and so exact, it feels like your vocal line is starting to swim a little bit within that. Mm -hmm. And I like that as opposed to having yeah. a very strict vocal line, that you're swimming within that. I sought him but found him I will arise. I will seek him who my soul I 
Just this note has so much to say. When you talk about she was afraid of failing, in a singing sense that would be not getting the note, or it would be... It might be not getting the note, but it might not be getting the note in the right way. That's yeah. what Fides was talking about, the pure sound. You do all this research, you investigate the so-called extended range, and all those cracks and all those colors and all those different shades and qualities, not just for their interest, I mean, they are interesting and they are fascinating, but also so that you can come back to a very simple, pure, beautiful sound informed by all that journey that you've made. That's why I get very moved when I hear Fide singing quite quietly and simply and gently because I hear all of that other stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. It's all in the sound. I will rise now, I will seek him who my soul loveth. I sought him but found. You do have a unique perspective on practically entire history of relationships with men, right? I suppose and you also that's have true. a history of my relationship to my voice. See me with drink, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Mm -hmm. Seem to remember that the and you were sort of touching on that earlier in relation to the the, the love for the cracks or the, or the wish to just do nothing but broken sound mm -hmm. for a certain part in your life. But there was also a part in your life where you were just, um, where you were having some kind of, what would one call it? There was like veils around some of the sound. And then the I have put off my coat, that's just where you're, like you're putting off your vocal coat as well. You're just peeling everything off and you're absolutely raw. So I think it actually does probably coincide chronologically with the unraveling of a marriage. <laughs> Because this one, I think, is certainly the most... It's true. Oh, it, it even comes with notes in it. It, it has its own dry wet nap. <laughs> Where the heck are these from? I just Sorry. opened up the mail the other day, and there they are, and she needs more initials on them. So these are pretty... I was served in February. I divorced a good half year before I was technically finally every little bit of the paper divorced. This is the first time, not the second time. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does take a while. So, <laughs> all that divorce stuff. Madame? Elle est prête. Your dress. And then with the diamante here, the same uh -huh. here and here. It might be too much, I'm not sure. And also just that whole idea of the night sky, if this yeah. is a gown like the night sky, that yeah. it is so dark and blue, yeah. but also with little glittery elements. The line, look not upon me, is still slightly mysterious to me. Yeah? Yeah. Not, I don't mean musically, I mean... I thought it worked well, because it kind of sets us back up for the next chorus. It's, just, it's all that, you know... No, 
it's, 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 it's an acting thing. It's yeah. like, what's, what's my motivation yeah. in that moment yeah. to say, look not upon me? Yeah, I think it is a mysterious line. I was actually thinking about that last mm -hmm. night because it's interesting. It's coming in this whole wardrobe section. Of like, I've taken <laughs> yeah. off my yeah. coat. I've washed Wash my, my feet. feet. I think there are many readings along with the sick of love. It's a moment of vulnerability and also I think that sense of being sick with love where you can't, sometimes it's almost too much to take mm -hmm. it all mm -hmm. in so you have to look away. It is just so you know, you're not you're standing on an edge, but it's not a super high yeah, no, no. edge. Well, I would have I that concern over the palace or with me up on the edge. <laughs> Where did the coat come from? Just out of curiosity. Why? For a harness. Huh? A harness, which hasn't been discussed, right? To do with the jump? Well, if you're standing on the edge, you're going to be wearing a harness. Yeah. So. How does so the my harness... vertigo just kicked in for a second there. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Like Sorry, I'm afraid of height. What is your relationship to height in your life? Oh, I tend to have vertigo. Because that... You mean? Yeah, like that? yeah, because two of the biggest fears we have as mm -hmm. human beings is the fear of height mm -hmm. and the fear of death. Why should there be such a literal physical fear when we're just talking, you know, vocal cords in a way? The fear of height in life comes before the fear of height in voice, in my view. Huh. And I think the more both grounded you become and the more fearless you become in terms of the other direction. Yeah. In other words, height based on depth, you know. A lot of that is set up by certain approach to limits uh -huh. in the voice, limits in the range. When I was first working with you, I thought, all my range, you know, the extra octave that was coming in below and the, the space on top would all sound like my classical mezzo right. voice. This was, I, I, and right. I kept waiting for that to happen and it's almost like I couldn't accept these other sounds as valid right off the bat. They do actually have intrinsic musical value, but, but they also have an incredible value in introducing the singer to that world of vibration, which is above what they think of as their top limit. And so when I understood that the range opening up meant also different colors and so forth, it was almost like hindsight. I went, oh, oh, yes, that part of my voice has opened up. Mm. It sounds different. It's like mm. a different aspect of personality or a different view. And I wonder if that relates to this breakthrough I've had sort of over the last half year with the high part of my voice where I'm not as afraid to, to go in. In fact, I feel like I can luxuriate there. I just had this major flashback to being in church at the age of 14 in North Bay and wanting to get up and scream. Just aching to scream, and this was every week, week after week, wanting to scream, because for me that container of church was the, I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but was that container of perfection, was that container of what I needed to aspire to, to attain, and all I wanted to do when I got onto stage once I'd broken through a certain place was make big, corded, shredded sounds that lived right within the cracks. And then I would say I started making a journey towards an integration of more of what would be a beautiful aspect within my voice, but from this perspective of that whole journey as opposed to this held onto notion of beauty that I arrived with when I was just trained in the classical realm, when I was too afraid to show what it would be to have my, my anger in its fullest on the stage. Again, that notion of beauty or transcending an aspect of human flesh through the voice, whereas really now the voyage is through human flesh and the soul into the expression. In the short film Opening Night, the scream has a dramatic purpose, Yes, yeah. And it is supposed to turn to into the note because the idea is that the scream in your head is how you produce the note. When the scream goes into a clear space or an un corded space, I think it's about liberation. Yeah. Yeah. The scream is the doorway through to that, that in expressing the scream, you can express 
the joyous space or whatever, right? It becomes a liberating thing. And that's certainly with the work with Richard was how that scream first came in, was going through an incredibly almost toxic sound space, right. being willing to express it and then finding that it led straight to beauty, right? Yeah. right. So that's, but it wasn't to contain beauty. It was like sure. big, huge rapturous space. I think people know that the voice is going to reveal. We're not led to believe that exposing ourselves to people is is healthy or permitted or welcome. There may be things mm. that we're not aware of, mm. that we don't know what, what will mm. pop up, or just that we don't know if people will accept seeing that part of ourselves. Mm. So I think that, I think people know intuitively the voice will show a lot, right? It's personal, it's, yeah. it's emotional. Yeah, the voice is this incredible Geiger counter to the personality, or you can say it's also the muscle of the soul, if you like, God, complemented by muscle, physical body. And that, in the young child, in the baby, is connected. The baby makes sound for hours on end without ever getting a sore throat. The sound vibrates right through to the feet and the wriggling toes. Um, <laughs> As we grow up, we lose that uh, capacity and we become <laughs> the tortured individuals we are. This is your undergarment? Mm -hmm. my, my torture. Yeah. My torture. My yeah, house torture. of torture <laughs> item. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Made for you by Miss Emma. Okay. So this one. Of course. Two. And they immediately give back Good pain. Yeah. Oh. I remember that from when I was first performing, and I, often there'd be corsets in a lot of operas, or a lot of corsets, right? These, these are the and it was just like, out, okay, yes. I've been back pain before going on stage. To me. So it sits like this, just below, right? See, this is where we're fighting physics, because the, the very front one... Emma checked out all sorts of yeah, books from the library on um, various undergarments. There's one illustration of a woman who's fallen and she can't get up because she's caught in her hoop skirt. And then weren't you saying there are like deaths by corset, where various organs had been displaced oh, yeah. and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's oh. Despair. Oh, now I can't breathe. Inspire. Sperare. Yeah. Is it yeah. sperare that's yeah. to breathe? Because yeah. that's one thing that I was thinking a lot a lot about is how do you get inspiration from your despair? And then how does the cage work? That's what I don't understand. Ken has very elegantly designed it all and I haven't seen it in its finished yes. state, but it's in panels. panels. They'll all unlace and then mm. two of the panels come up. Right? Yeah. Cool. It's all out of copper? It's all out of copper. Beautiful. Yeah, copper. Because so we were thinking insect stuff, because since we we're working with that Again, the Madame Butterfly thing, that whole idea of a transformation, how to turn something into the shape of wings. I was thinking about the butterfly story because in a sense, when we were talking about opera heroines, she doesn't actually achieve a transformation. She does have a death, right? Her situation with this American man leads her to kill herself. You could call that a type of transformation, but I'm not sure that it's deeply satisfying to a modern woman to think that your only option is to kill yourself. think about the fact that potentially the opposite may always be true. One of the things about the training that I had was that there were these sayings that got said at certain moments and they were very profound and they meant a lot to me and one of them was that the moment of greatest peril always coincides with the moment of greatest hope. Mm. So, you know, it's the classic idea at the moment of greatest despair there is always the chink of light. What's the catalyst between if you, to get from a point of loss or despair, how do you get to that point of um, inspiration? What allows for choice as opposed to no choice? How, up, 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 up. Oh, that's fine, yeah. Yeah. The aspect of divorce, right, which you've experienced, which I've experienced, and I'm not saying that it's specific in a way to that aspect of male and female, but for me, leaving my partner was very much about stepping into creative fruition.
the theme is larger than a single relationship. Yeah, the surely. theme that's being played out of whether it's clarity, he's eventually finding clarity, but by finding all the different colors. It's the clarity that I was referring to earlier, which um, is informed by all of those other things that you've right. sung and yeah. experienced. Yeah. But there's something genuine about that that's about trusting myself more. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like an aspect of deeply trusting yeah, absolutely. myself. And I love this notion of the beloved, right? And the soul finding the beloved, because there's an aspect of to really know where your soul is at on a certain level is that sense of clarity. thing I need right now. better if it was a little tighter at the back. Yeah. Great. Now I can't breathe. And I'm certainly not going to be able to sing. And nobody sees it anyways. It's underneath the dress. Well, it's too late to do anything about that now. I think it looks great as it is. I have to go. You know, you don't have to wear this. I have plenty of time. I can change it for you if you want. You know the high F section? If you find my beloved, 
Tell him I am sick of love. How about, for I am sick of love. Don't think I can focus on that just at the moment. Now, what do I need? But what do you think? For I am sick of love. This is going to be a good one. I think you think too much. It's good. Why can't you just tell me that? Here, have a drink. Stay me with drink, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. So 